Hello, everyone. This is Josh Valentine of the Clean Coalition. I hope everyone is staying safe out there, and I want to thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Grid Saturation Lessons from Australia and Hawaii. Before we get started, as usual, I'd like to point out the GoToWebinar control panel. This is where you can type in your questions for the Q&A session for the two speakers at the end of the webinar. If you have questions you'd like answered, they will try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A portion. Uh, simply just type your question into the box. It says questions and we will see them. The recording and slides will be sent to registered attendees within two business days. All webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org and the Clean Coalition's YouTube channel. And if you have any general questions about the webinars that we put on, please email me at josh at clean-coalition.org. And if you have any other questions about the Clean Coalition, you can send that to me as well. Our, our uh, speakers today, Steve Thrall, Director of Development at North America at Planet Arc Power. After first working with Planet Arc Power in their Australia office, Steve has returned home to his country of Canada to lead Planet Arc Power's global expansion into the North America clean energy market using their game-changing technology, Alexis, an AI and IoT-based solution that transforms the electricity grid into a true two-way grid. The other speaker, Ben Schwartz, he's a policy associate right here at the Clean Coalition. Ben focuses primarily on representing the Clean Coalition and proceedings at the CPUC on microgrids and net energy metering. Ben is also a fourth year student in UCSB and uses his background in environmental studies and history and public policy to inform the diverse local, state, and national policy work he does at the Clean Coalition. So now, put it off to Ben. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, let's make sure that this is working. Okay. Looks great. Looks great, Ben. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to echo what Josh was saying and thank everyone for attending. And with that, um, I'm going to jump right in. Let's start with the agenda for today's webinar. Um, so I'm going to start with the Clean Coalition's mission and the Glida Load Pocket Community Microgrid. And then I'm going to have an overview of Planet Arc Power and Alexis. Uh, third, we're going to move to Australia and learn some lessons from the leader in rooftop solar. Then we're going to move to Hawaii, policy evolution required to accommodate high saturations of rooftop solar and storage. And then we're gonna take those lessons and move to California, seeing what can be learned from Australia and Hawaii. Okay. Let's move on. So the Clean Coalition's mission is as a nonprofit organization to accelerate the transition of renewable energy and a modern grid through technical policy and project development expertise. It takes a, a target um, specifically renewable energy. And so what we're trying to do, knowing that California is on its way to 100% renewable energy is be specific. 25% of that energy should be, according to the Co Clean Coalition, local and interconnected within the distribution grid, which is helping ensure resilience. 25% on a local grid is enough for 100% resilience without depending on the transmission grid. That means that 75% of that energy can be remote and fully dependent on the transmission grid. So next, let's talk about community microgrids. Community microgrids are a new approach for designing and operating the electric grid, stacked with local renewables and staged for resilience. Community microgrids take a target area and basically connect that within the distribution grid. And this includes a high penetration of DER and resilience. Some key 
features of a community microgrid include a targeted and coordinated distribution grid area served by one or more substations. And ultimately, this can include a transmission distribution substation setting the stage for distribution service operator, DSO. And this also includes a stage capability for indefinite renewables driven backup power for critical community facilities around the grid area, which would be achieved by the 25% local renewables mix. So when it comes to community microgrids, the Goleta Load Pocket is the perfect opportunity for a comprehensive community microgrid. If we take a look at the map there, the GOP spans 70 miles of the California coastline, and right in the middle is UCSB. It also incorporates the cities of Goleta, Santa Barbara, and Carpinteria, the largest three layer states. The GOP is interesting because it's transmission vulnerable and disaster prone. In the past couple of years, there have been the Thomas fire and debris flows, but there could also be other rain, landslides, and earthquakes as well. Um, this is specifically only an area of the county served by SCE. And so if you take a look at the purple line on the map, there's only one pair of transmission lines. They run on the same easement on the mountain. And because of that, there's a definite need for resilience. SCE, SCE has already admitted that they need to replace it and that it is potentially vulnerable to multiple issues. Now, with that in mind, um, the, the GOP is so important because community microgrids could provide that resilience. According to Clean Coalition calculations, 200 megawatts of solar and 400 megawatts of energy storage will provide 100% renewable, uh, renewable backup resilience in the GLP. And that can only be done, well, that could actually be done with specifically uh, solar siting opportunities on com commercial scale built environments, parking lots, parking structures, and rooftops. Now, 80% of what is needed could be done on parking lots alone in the GLP, which is pretty standard in a current area. With that background on community microgrids and the GLP, ideally we want this territory to be able to fully deploy a community microgrid and DER solutions, allowing 100% results. Great. With that in mind, let's start to talk about Planet Art Power. Planet Art Power is a leader in Australia who is looking to bring their solutions to the US, particularly California. Planet Art Power is interested in what the Clean Coalition is doing, and we at the Clean Coalition believe that their solutions will help bring the electric industry the changes that we are interested in and we need. The Clean Coalition is aligned with Planet Art Power's goals, and we like each other. So with that in mind, let me hand it over to uh, my partner for today, fellow pre presenter, Steve. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, there we go. Can everyone see my screen? Josh, we good? Looks great. Perfect. Thank you, Ben and Josh. Um, as was already mentioned, my name is Steve Thrall, uh, and I'm the Director of Development for North America with Planet Arc Power. Uh, so Planet Arc Power is an Australian engineering and technology company, and we've developed a solution that enables the world's first two-way clean energy grid. Our Lexus technology radically speeds, increases the amount of rooftop solar that can be installed on the distribution grid and allows for the quick and cost-effective decarbonization of the electricity sector. So what is Alexis? Well, Alexis is a combination of power electronics paired with advanced AI software that manages voltage using reactive power control in real time, while also monitoring market price signals to maximize the economic returns of a customer's solar plus storage system. Alexis is installed behind the meter and in combination with advanced smart inverters to manage voltage and allow for the safe, uninterrupted export of clean energy into the grid. This allows customers to overcome curtailment restrictions and avoid the need for costly distribution grid upgrades. Alexis was recently recognized on the world stage, winning the 2019 Startup Energy Transition Awards on behalf of the World Energy Council 
and German Energy Agency. So why Planet Earth Power and why Alexis? Well, Australia happened to be one of the first places in the world to experience the rooftop solar boom. As a result, it was also the first place to face the widespread challenges caused by high saturations of rooftop solar. Electri electricity grids around the world are fundamentally all designed the same. So for the rest of the world, Australia can serve as the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, in terms of understanding the challenges that will be faced globally as DER saturations continue to rise. So what is the problem? Well, the traditional electricity grid is designed to be one way. It's designed to have energy flow from centralized generation, whether that be a coal plant, a solar farm, a wind farm, whatever it may be, to the end customer. And this one-way grid has a limited hosting capacity for rooftop solar, which requires a two-way grid so that excess energy can be exported. Once local saturation levels exceed around 15% of the substation's equipment rating, then the distribution grid begins to experience problems with voltage volatility. The response by the utilities is to either complete distribution grid upgrades to increase that hosting capacity, which is common in North America and under net energy metering, or they work within the constraints of the existing grid and they curtail export, which is how it's managed in Australia. We'll get into both of those in, in further slides. Um, grid upgrades are really expensive and they only offer a short-term solution. So more upgrades will be needed in the future as DER saturations continue to rise. Curtailment, on the other hand, significantly reduces the economically viable size of solar and storage systems as all excess generation is wasted. Customers therefore only install a system that's matched, that will, that's sized to match self, their self-consumption. Curtailment also destroys project bankability for large CNI projects that require third-party financing because of intermittent revenue streams it creates. So we developed Alexis. Now Alexis manages voltage volatility at the source, enabling 100% export while ensuring a safe and reliable electricity grid. It's installed behind the meter and paid for by the site through increased returns. So there's no cost to the grid. Alexis provides up to a 13 times increase in the amount of DER that can be installed, making the world's first two-way clean energy grid. This two-way energy flow makes virtual power plants and community microgrids possible. It allows local renewables to provide clean energy and resiliency to the, to the communities they serve. By guaranteeing 100% export, Alexis also creates bankability for third-party investment by ensuring a consistent and forecastable revenue stream. This in turn allows institutional investors like pension funds to invest into DER. So Alexis is not just about the engineering solution to manage the voltage, but also about the business model it enables by unlocking this institutional investment. So let's look at some examples. But first, it's important to understand the basic energy policy in Australia. So Australia uses feed-in tariffs to compensate customers for excess solar generation that's exported to the grid. Rarely are distribution grid upgrades completed to increase hosting capacity because they're expensive and unsustainable. Instead, Australia has decided to simply utilize the grid that they have. Once hosting capacity limits are reached, solar curtailment restrictions are imposed, and solar generation can only be self-consumed. The result is much smaller installations as systems are designed to only match self-consumption. Again, CNI customers who typically require third-party financing often can't get it because revenue streams are intermittent due to curtailment, which creates risk. So here's an example of a CNI site in, in Australia. As you'll see, the picture on the left shows the economically viable solar installation with curtailment restrictions imposed. The customer would only install a system large enough to match the site's self-consumption, leaving the rest of the roof space simply wasted. Then you have the picture on the right, which shows the installation potential with Alexis. By managing voltage and ensuring 100% export, the entire roof space can now be utilized. Excess generation is exported to the grid, providing increased savings to the customer and additional clean energy to the community. So Planet Earth Power is currently completing our flagship project, which will be done later this year. It's 3.2 megawatts of solar and 3.4 megawatt hours of batteries. Now this project would not be possible without Alexis, due to hosting capacity limitations, curtailment, and intermittent revenue streams. The project will be owned by one of Australia's largest pension funds, earning them a revenue for the 20-year project life. The customer will purchase clean energy 
for PPA, saving them roughly a million dollars annually and hedging them against rising electricity costs. Excess energy from the solar and batteries will be exported to the grid, earning revenue through various grid services such as frequency control, ancillary services, and energy arbitrage. And finally, the building owner also receives rent for the rooftop. So this model solves the split incentive pro problem that's traditionally restricted CNI from installing solar and storage. So again, Alexis is not just about the engineering solution, but also the business model that it enables. Due to voltage volatility and the risk of curtailment, this project would have been non-bankable to the pension fund. However, Alexis overcomes this by harmonizing the grid to deliver a predictable income stream, enabling billions to be invested into DER. The pension funds already committed $200 million to be spent on similar projects for the next four years, and this customer is seeking similar projects in all of their buildings throughout Australia. Now, let's have a look at North America. So as you know, behind the meter rooftop solar is generally compensated through net energy metering. And the fundamental market structure of NEM is built on the ability of the customer to use the grid as a virtual battery. You can access, excess solar generation can be exported, and credits that can then offset against grid supplied energy consumed later. Because of this structure though, the excess energy must be always exported. You have to be able to export the energy. So sufficient hosting capacity on the grid must always exist. When the hosting capacity limits are reached and the grid becomes constrained, the, utip the utility typically completes distribution grade upgrades to increase that capacity. These upgrade costs are either passed on to the utility's rate base or directly to the developer and customer for larger installations. So the result is increased electricity prices for everyone or increased project costs and reduced returns for the developer and customer if they're, if they're um, responsible for the upgrade costs themselves. The challenge is that these upgrades don't fix the voltage problem. So as more solar gets installed, more upgrades will be required. So let's move on to Hawaii. Hawaii has some of the highest solar saturations in the US. One in five residential customers have rooftop solar compared to the national average of just one in 50. Hawaii is also unique in that they've traditionally depended on imported petroleum for electricity generation. This caused them to have the highest retail electricity rates in the US, but roughly three times that of the national average. So in 2015, Hawaii also became the first US state to commit to 100% renewables. And so it's the combination of all these factors that really helped spur Hawaii's rooftop solar boom. So with the boom in rooftop solar came a decrease in annual electricity costs for customers until around 2016 when the trend reversed. Now the question is why did that happen? Well, as solar saturations rose, the grid became more constrained and upgrades were required. These upgrades were completed by the utility, with costs passed on to the customers in the form of higher retail electricity rates. And so then again, the homeowners saw their total electricity costs begin to rise. Now, the PUC identified that utility capital and operation expenditures were driving up retail electricity rates. NEM and distribution grid upgrades simply are not a sustainable way to achieve 100% renewable energy targets. So in 2015, PUC, the PUC decided it was time to transition away from net metering. And so they've replaced it with two different programs to replace now. These programs were uh, designed to better align solar output with grid needs. Two programs are customer self-supply and customer grid supply. So under customer self-supply, energy can be self-consumed but never exported. This is the same general policy mechanism as curtailment and zero export restrictions that's being used in Australia. The program still incentivizes solar and storage the systems are only sized to match site self-consumption needs and all the other generations wasted. This results in wasted roof space and wasted energy, especially in CNI. Now, customer grid supply is similar to a feed-in tariff uh, in which customer can still export energy, but is compensated at a much lower rate than retail. So when designed correctly, feed-in tariffs are an excellent way to incentivize the installation of rooftop solar as they can make it economically viable to maximize a roof space. Now, much like Australia, Hawaii has chosen a similar policy path to manage voltage volatility and a constrained grid. This policy progression is likely to occur in other regions throughout the US as DER saturations continue to rise. With Alexis, 
we're able to increase the grid's hosting capacity by up to 13 times. This allows for more solar and storage to be installed and enables market mechanisms that fairly compensate for the energy being provided to the local community. So Hawaii still has a long ways to go, as does Australia and as does everywhere else in the world. But they're clearly a leader in their pursuit of achieving 100% renewable energy. Hawaii has shown that stakeholder alignment is absolutely key. That starts with renewable advocates like the Clean Coalition uh, and building community support, right up to utility, regulatory, and political leadership. Stakeholder alignment is essential if we're to transition to a clean energy world. So on that, I'll pass it back to Ben, who's going to discuss California and, and what California is doing to progress towards their 100% clean energy goals. Right. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, so I just want to kind of give a brief overview. Um, there's a lot of things that we can learn from Hawaii specifically. And to try to get to it on a high level, um, I'm just going to try to bring some things in that Hawaii is doing correctly and then compare it to California and what California needs to be doing. Um, so I just want to start by agreeing Hawaii has done a really good job with stakeholder alignment. The HPUC, the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, and the utilities are on the same page about greenhouse gas reduction and the need for DER. One of the Hawaiian utilities, KUIC, the Kauai Island Utility, acts as a cooperative, meaning it's about the people rather than the financial incentive. Anyone who has developed a major infrastructure project can tell you having stakeholder alignment is key for success. You need to have municipalities, utilities, property owners, policymakers, residents, funders, all of these stakeholders have to be aligned for a successful project. Now, let's start with clean energy. As Steve mentioned in 2015, Hawaii became the first state in the nation to call for 100% renewable energy by 2045 when they passed House Bill 623. Later that year, California passed SB 350, mimicking Hawaii with a call for 100% clean energy by 2045. However, uh, Last year, the two PUCs signed a, a, an MOU, essentially supporting each other and uh, creating basically a system where they could work together and share information to get the best possible uh, policy goals and uh, policy in place. Hawaii is doing extremely well. Like California, it has RPS goals, and Hawaii believes it will achieve 40% renewable energy by 2040. Already, the Kauai Island Utility Corporate, co Cooperative rather, has achieved 56% renewable energy in 2019, already surpassing that landmark. And this is done in large part in addition to large penetrations of rooftop solar, it is done because of large utility scale projects as well as innovative new tariffs. Uh, so let's keep going and let's start with, if I can change the slide, the new microgrid tariff in Hawaii. In February 19th, the HPUC started a new proceeding to properly compensate owners and streamline the interconnection process for new microgrids. In December of last year, the proceeding revealed a draft tariff, and on March 3rd of this year, ECHO, the Hawaiian Electric Company, officially filed a draft tariff with the HPUC. Now, that being said, the tariff itself is not exactly as um, beneficial or advanced as many people would hope. Because of their three tracks, this tariff is focused on short-term issues, meaning that there is nothing related to expedited interconnection, nothing related to creating a standard value of resilience. Um, microgrids in island mode cannot be counted towards RPS, and this is only focusing on behind-the-meter microgrids. Essentially, this is not exactly what people hoped for, but it's the start of what could be a more detailed tariff down the line. And that being said, California also has uh, followed Hawaii with a microgrid proceeding as well. 
And the microgrid proceeding just came out with a proposed decision for the first track with expedited interconnection for specific critical facility microgrids, as well as pre-approved single line diagrams to ensure interconnection is not what stops microgrids from being uh, deployed. In addition, that the proposed decision suggests increased information sharing between utilities and local governments, as well as removing sizing limits for energy storage. Ensuring that microgrids will be used successfully in the short term for resilience, but also in the long term, questions still need to be answered about the value of resilience, as well as other aspects of how to make a community microgrid acceptable. Going back to Hawaii, Hawaii has done a very good job promoting resilience and ensuring that the utilities are also promoting resilience. Uh, that starts with the, alter the alternative, non-wire alternatives being proposed by the utilities. In August of last year, the P Hawaii PUC uh, criticized the Hawaii Electric Company's decision for too much reliance on traditional distribution infrastructure upgrades as opposed to non-wire alternatives that would promote DER and resilience in the long term. Both the HPC as well as HECO concluded that the question of resilience is too important to be overlooked. The question is how to achieve that resilience. Now, here in California, the same remains true. The question of resilience is too important not to be considered in detail. And the reason for that is because there's no one who has yet been able to quantify the value of resilience, despite the fact that resilience is of such importance. The Clean Coalition has established a standard value of resilience and hopes to uh, make this clear in the policy worlds as well. To do this, um, the Clean Coalition basically cut the load into three different tiers. The first tier is usually around 10% and focuses on mission critical life sustaining loads. The second one is about 15% of the load and is this priority load, essentially anything that can be maintained as long as it doesn't threaten the first tier, the important load. And tier three is everything else, the discretionary load, 75% of the total load that is not the tier one and tier two loads and can be kept on as long as those two are kept on as well. And I know that's a bit hard to understand. Here's a gra uh, graph on the subject. And um, specifically in total, the Clean Coalition has determined that the value of resilience is a 25% adder on top of non-resilient electricity. The way this is calculated is with tier one, 100% resilience is worth three to five times the normal price for electricity. For tier two, 80% resilience is worth 1.5 to three times, and discretionary loads is worth zero. Together, coming out to an extra 25% of the normal price, which is something that needs to be considered for the true value of something like a microgrid and resilience to really be considered. And let's continue on. Okay. So talking about resilience, uh, we come to the case study of direct relief. Direct relief is the pride and joy of Santa Barbara. It's a nonprofit um, that is a pharmaceutical warehouse and they send pharmaceutical supplies all over the world during disasters. Um, what that means is that they need cold storage to ensure that the, the medicine stays effective. And so they have to have resilience. And as a result, Direct Relief installed a microgrid, a solar plus storage microgrid as a backup, and a diesel generator as a backup to the backup. Uh, so you can see from this picture that um, the roof has solar, but it doesn't nearly cover the entire roof. So essentially, Direct Relief was only able to post or was able to put enough solar on the roof to get to net zero. Beyond that, there was no real way to do it within net limits, 
NEM limits, that is. And if they were to consider things like wholesale interconnection through um, a WDAT tariff, there's nothing specifically that could make it economically viable. So let's take a look at what they could be doing. Only around 30% of the roof is being used, and that it doesn't even consider parking lots and parking structures. Additional storage is also not being considered. So in reality, when it comes down to it, Direct Relief wants to be a part of a community microgrid. They want to be able to help increase the capacity of the feeder and act as resilience, but there are no market mechanisms that would allow this to occur. And the current policy does not allow for extra solar beyond net zero. Essentially, a policy mechanism needs to exist that would allow a site like Direct Relief to maximize the siting opportunity. And that's where we come to talk about feed-in tariffs. Now, uh, Steve mentioned a little bit that there are some feed-in tariffs in Hawaii, and Hawaii's actually been using them since 2014, where they ensured that only uh, small commercial and industrial uh, deployments would be using any sort of fits. And as of April 20 this year, um, around 33, I think 32 applications are currently in place in the queue um, to use the fit. Now, a feed-in tariff is standard-based long-term guaranteed contract, which allows other uh, smaller lo local renewable energy projects to sell the power to a local utility. Clean Coalition feed-in tariffs use market responsive pricing, which allows a base rate to be set and ensures that energy contracts are set at the best price, meaning that they can either be adjusted up or down depending on the market rate. And this uh, dispatchability adder like DEX can offer a fixed kilowatt hour bonus on top of a feed-in tariff rate. So uh, this dispatchability, dispatchability adder, DEX, or Dispatchable Energy Capacity Services, um, is generalized so a utility can contract for energy so storage out of a battery and use it for whatever that utility wants. That could be frequency regulation, ramp smoothing, load shifting, resilience, whatever. Essentially, the utility can shift for what they need it for. So let's say they can use part of that for resilience or for something else. The point being, the utility gets a certain portion of the state of charge of the battery, and the storage owner, which is important, gets a single bankable revenue stream, something that's currently missing in the market today. And considering that California needs energy storage and resilience in the future, it would be essential to have some sort of contract like DEX that would allow an owner of energy storage to actually make some sort of money. The cost of service needs to incorporate the net cost of energy from the battery, CapEx and OpEx costs from the battery, allowing the owner to make some sort of profit. In the long run, this would not only help with NEM, but in general, it would help with the situation with Direct Relief, who wanted energy storage under WDG, but was not necessarily able to do so. So WDG, um, it's kind of the middle between two extremes. So there is retail distributed generation, which is a specific on-site load on the one hand, and that's behind the meter. On the other hand, there is central generation, large solar farms that are directly connected to the transmission grid, the metal poles. And in between that, there is wholesale WDG, which is interconnected in the front of the meter, but it's specifically connected to the distribution grid. And the reason that this matters is because this is a portion of utility uh, scale projects that is broken in California because the interconnection process is not streamlined. It can take years to interconnect a WDG project 
making it harder and more expensive the longer it takes. Uh, the Clean Coalition has designed an interconnection pilot for this program and um, realizes that the same is true for Hawaii. If Hawaii wants to consider interconnection in their microgrid tariff, um, they need to be able to streamline the process, not only for behind the meter microgrids, but also front of the meter, WDG, interconnected uh, microgrids as well. And with that in mind, um, let's move on. Okay, so the next slide is about transmission access charges. Um, and this is kind of important when, uh, after talking about wholesale distributed generation, because the proper rate of value, WDG, is through the value of resilience. It's uh, by properly addressing transmission access charges. It's once you have all of these things together that you can truly unleash the value of a community microgrid and DER. Um, so let's take a look at TAC. In a PTO participating transmission operator service territories in California, payers are charged the same amount for using the transmission system, which is measured at the customer meter. So the ratepayers are charged regardless of whether they actually use the transmission system hurting DER that is only using the distribution system. This cost is 4.5 cents from all WDG and NEM exports, 2.5 cents of which comes from the past values of transmission investments. Um, the other part, and I'll mention this in a moment, but I do wanna mention a recent policy win related to this. The Clean Coalition helps get the future transmission costs, two cents, added to the avoided cost calculator, now in all three IOU service territories, it only used to be considered in pg and territory. What this means is that with the 2.5 cents in past cost, and with the avoided cal cost calculator, 2.2 cents of future costs is a total of 4.5 cents in transmission access charges that are automatically added to all projects. In reality, when you take this away, clean local energy is of a better value than anything else. And this needs to be considered before it can be truly valued. Okay. And with that in mind, I think the last kind of important part of this is something Hawaii has been doing very well for years, and that's performance-based regulations. Um, Starting in 2014, the Hawaii PUC put out a paper entitled Aligning the Utility Business Model with Customer Interests and Policy Goals. Essentially, the utility uh, or the commission put out a paper determining what the ideal utility would look like and how the PUC could align with that utility to ensure it happens. So relating to that, um, HPUC Commissioner Jennifer Potter mentioned, the current regulatory model encourages companies to make large capital investments to earn a return. Our efforts will break that link so that utilities can earn a return on providing services and programs instead of just capital investments. We must think of a broader set of regulatory mechanisms that allows the utility to move with flexibility and accelerate our path to renewable energy. Regulation is where the rubber hits the road. And uh, specifically of performance-based regulation and for an ideal utility, the HPUC created a guide for 21st century generation systems to create a sense of urgency by the utilities. They also created a modern transmission and distribution guide to determine how the utility would upgrade the infrastructure properly, and policy and regulatory reforms to achieve Hawaii's clean energy future. By putting these guides out for the public and for the utilities, it allowed the utilities to help shift to a model based off of performance that rewards them, rather than having a financial incentive that rewards the shareholders when a utility upgrades infrastructure. And as a part of that, 
the requirements are as follows too. Uh, there are two things. The first is the utility is required to create a multi-year rate plan with predetermined formulas for revenue adjustment. And the second is performance mechanisms that allow uh, increases or reduced revenue based off of the metrics. And these specifically are what the HPUC is relying on to um, ensure that the utilities meet their demands and their goals. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is one of the things that California should be trying to achieve to ensure that there's greater cooperation between utilities, the ratepayers, and the PUC. Um, and I guess as part of that, it's essential to realize that one of these issues alone is not enough to help California unleash DER and through it, the value of community microgrids. Just as much as a value of resilience is essential, it's also essential to help get rid of tax charges. Um, Hawaii specifically had a public utilities commission that was in favor and, and aligned with its utilities as well as its shareholders. And yet somehow when it came down to it and planning grid upgrades, the utility still ended up with traditional ideas about infrastructure upgrades instead of non-wire alternatives. So clearly one thing alone is not good enough. All of these things together are the policy achievements that need to happen to properly value DER. And with that in mind, I just would like to um, say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Thank you, Ben. Yes, there are uh, for you and Steve. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you can go back to the uh, slide two um, to show where people can enter in their questions, that would be great. Um, so thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ben, for great presentations. Um, so now we're going to get to the Q&A section of our, uh, the webinar. And if uh, there is anyone out there who still wants to submit a question, feel free to do so. We've got about uh, 17 minutes left. Go to the control panel and enter it into the questions box. All right. So uh, for Steve on Alexis. There's yeah, a two, go for it. Uh, uh, these are complimentary questions. So if you need me to repeat, just let me know. From Claire Broom, an adjunct professor at Emory University, uh, Claire asked, please provide more information on how Alexis provides Ulta's regulation services to the distribution grid. Um, and then Ron Leonard, founder at Eco NRG, uh, states, you have not explained what your device does besides fixing the voltage problem. Voltage problems are not the issue. Is, is it was two ways, two way flows to a substation, yet excessive utility upgrades. What is the device? So if you want me to repeat that, uh, let me know, but. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I'm, I think I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, two, two really good questions. Um, so I guess just for starters, I'm, I'm not uh, an electrical engineer, so I'm, I might not get to the, the depth of answer that, uh, that you, Hope for, but uh, but we can certainly expand upon that offline if, if you need. Um, but basically, Alexis is is a combination of of the power electronics and AI, uh, and so it's silicon carbide power electronics that are fundamentally a DSTATCOM device that manages voltage volatility using reactive power control. Uh, our AI is used to manage voltage in real time, ensuring a safe and reliable distribution electricity grid while simultaneously making market-based decisions that maximize the economic returns of the solar and storage system. Um, and so, so Alexis is able to, it's designed to be installed um, in conjunction with, with smart inverters, and, but it's able to manage voltage using reactive power control um, much more efficiently and to, to a much um, greater level than smart inverters. And so then as a result, we're able to um, ensure the 100% export of energy and, and increase the, uh, the hosting capacity on the distribution grid by up to 13 times. Um, now, as far as uh, voltage being the issue, um, there's, there's a lot of research and studies out there and, and happy to, to get into that offline about how um, voltage is, is a major challenge with uh, reducing um, hosting capacity on the grid uh, as a result of rooftop solar and, and it needing to export to the grid. 
Um, so yeah, hopefully that's sufficient to answer that question. Great, thank you. So this one is from Robert. This is a, a lengthy one, but uh, let me know if you need, need to re repeat anything. Robert Perry, a principal consultant at Synergistic Solutions. Robert asks, what are your thoughts on a microgrid tariff, which retains site autonomy and energy generated, but allows for revenue from exporting and ancillary, ancillary grid services? Under this scenario, a site could use more on-site capacity during low production conditions, but export excess to but export excess during optimal conditions. Also, should sites be encouraged to add electrolysis to use excess energy for renewable hydrogen production? Um, yeah, I think like ultimately the, the goal is that you need to be able to have uh, clean energy, rooftop solar and batteries, be able to, to not only provide value to a customer behind the meter, but also participate uh, and provide value to the greater grid. Uh, so in Australia, for instance, um, we're able to use rooftop solar and batteries, and, and those batteries um, are able to do kind of your standard peak demand shaving and time of use arbitrage, uh, which is how behind the meter energy storage is, is typically used in California. Um, but then it's also able to use that excess energy to provide grid services. So frequency control, ancillary services, um, and participate in the wholesale energy arbitrage market. Uh, and, and currently from a, from a policy standpoint, that's not possible in California um, and really then limits how rooftop solar and batteries are able to, uh, to provide both value to the customer and to the grid. Um, so that's just an, an area of, of policy innovation, regulatory innovation that um, we're hoping will, will change uh, in the near future. Yeah, I would just add that um, if we take a look at Hawaii, they already have a large penetration of rooftop solar. And now the biggest issue is uh, a large amount of energy storage that can combine with it um, and especially deal with issues of frequency regulation. So I think when you have um, energy storage and especially considering California is going to be needing gigawatts of energy storage in the next decade, um, it's essential that there's some sort of energy, uh, there's some sort of market mechanism in place that allows it to actually uh, be an economic value stream. And I think that's also why something like DEX is, is so important, because that's exactly what it does. Great. Thank you both. All right. The next question comes from Claudia Sally, uh, director of the California Desert Coalition. Uh, Claudia is asking, where is California in aligning its policy to recognize avoided transmission costs in valuation of local generation, as CCAs have, have argued about unfair transmission costs assessed to them? So, um, specifically, the, the when recently was getting all of the um, IOUs to actually uh, consider future costs as part of the avoided cost calculator. Um, transmission access charges are kind of a, a tough one because it's something that both CAISO and the CPUC um, have to deal with and kind of both are, are pointing towards each other a little bit. Um, it's certainly something that's going to be looked at a little more in the microgrid proceeding, but as of now, um, it doesn't look like things are changing um, beyond TAC is being charged to every customer, the rate payer. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, Sanjil Law uh, is asking, how do you see these policies rolling out across the United States? Is there, a, is, are there similar initiatives at the FERC level? Um, so most states around the United States um, are reliant on, on NEM as well, rather than curtailments. So there's definitely um, a similarity between California and those states. Um, in addition, I guess it also depends on um, the ISO in charge. But at the federal level, um, I guess, so 
FERC Order 841 is relating to battery storage. Um, the, the KISO market also has kind of day ahead markets that allow for hybrid um, resources. So that could mean solar plus storage as well. Um, so I think what's going on here and um, even in, in the federal market here is going to be repeated around the country. Um, resilience is becoming a big issue as well and non-wire alternatives. So I think, you know, Hawaii and California are kind of, to a certain extent, the standard bearers for, for um, other state policies, if that helps. Yeah, just, just to add to that, Ben, um, distribution grids around the world are, are fundamentally, you know, designed the same. And as more DER is interconnected, the challenges of voltage volatility that are already being experienced in California and Hawaii and, and other uh, pockets throughout the US will continue to rise. So um, the kind of right now, the current method of, of completing these grid upgrades is really expensive and, and causes electricity prices to rise uh, for everybody, um, often uh, those costs being kind of unproportionately and equitably borne by uh, certain parts, demographics of, of the population. And so I think as, as saturations continue to rise, there'll be increased pressure to come up with a different system and, and net energy metering um, just doesn't end up uh, kind of getting to being effective in getting to 100% clean energy goals that, that uh, an increasing amount of uh, states and locations around the world are um, committing to. Thank you, Ben and Steve. All right, so the next question is from Norman Wilson, principal at Rex Wilson, LLC. Uh, Norman's asking, what is the outlook at the CPUC for improved interconnection approval for wholesale distributed generation? Um, okay, uh, so I can start from um, the perspective of the microgrid proceeding um it was the 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 first track of the proceeding was mostly about kind of short-term issues um but the second and third are going to be about broader state goals things like uh, determining a value of resilience um and non behind the meter microgrids so anything with multiple customers um so i think there's some potential there to address wholesale interconnection. Um, but I guess what I was saying during the webinar applies, it's that there's not just one aspect of it that you need to fix. I mean, there are multiple things. So interconnection is an issue as well. Um, and I think the interconnection proceeding will be addressing this some as well. So it's kind of little steps forward, I think, um, that will really, really make this important. Um, but the more regulation there is around energy storage and the more um, energy storage is allowed as um, a bankable stream of revenue, I think there will be definitely more um, done at the CPUC to, to allow it to occur. I'm not, I'm not sure if that helps uh, answer the question specifically, though. No, thank you, Ben. Um, uh, Bert Wank, CEO at Inferel Corporation, asks, how does DER overcome ETJ's uh, legal restrictions? For instance, sharing of power across property parcels, demanding pay for poles and wires imposed by the local energy provider uh, for having made the investment into infrastructure. Um, so that's a good question. Um, and it depends. So for example, um, if a battery project is in front of the meter, it can potentially um, help share with a behind the meter solar project, uh, for example. Um, in terms of microgrids, that's one of the biggest issues is the over the fence rule is what, pre what prevents um, or has prevented community microgrids in the past. Um, and so the microgrid proceeding will kind of help deal with that, but it does prove that you need the stakeholder alignment of, um, of a utility. And 
Um, yes, Steve, did you want to mention anything about that? Yeah, in totally. I, think, I think that, um, you know, that's obviously, uh, there's a lot of, of layers to that onion, so to speak, and, and, um, and it's not kind of clear how you solve all those problems, but I think uh, what is sort of clear and what you're seeing with, uh, with Hawaii and, and, you know, the challenges that they've had um, and the need for that stakeholder alignment is that you're really changing uh, the fundamental system um, in terms of you no longer have uh, or you're trying to move away from a system of just having centralized generation and, and having the utility um, and, and they kind of they run everything and so you're uh, as you move away from that you're going to you're going to fundamentally change um, the way that the market operates and, and so for instance I think that um, you know as a potential solution that's um, you know, that gets brought up often is moving towards uh, like a DSO and having a, a distribution system operator and some of that. And and because the idea is not to get rid of utilities, you need uh, you need a really robust uh, distribution low voltage uh, grid uh, to be able to have these transactive energy markets. So it's not about getting rid of the utility or anything like that. You need them to survive. Um, and but it's just changing the the market mechanism so that. Uh, you can have prosumers and, and be able to um, have communities that are run on local renewables. Yeah, I'll also just add that um, the more that technology is improved and deployed, whether that's something like a Lexus or something like a smart inverter, I think um, the easier a process like that will become. Um, worrying about an issue over the fence or, or over a, a public street or something along those lines. All right, thank you both. David Brown, Principal Distribution System Engineer at SMUD asks, um, as solar costs decline, isn't limited curtailment often the more economical choice? Um, well, the, the challenge with with curtailment is um, is that it destroys the economics of, of a project. So, if you, uh, for instance, I'm speaking to to Australia, when you think of a large CNI project, um, if you're if that if the finances of that deal are built on being able to export energy, but you don't know whether your system will be curtailed in the future or when it will be curtailed, then you have an intermittent uh, intermittent revenue stream and, and that's where the the, uh, the bankability issue comes in and not being able to to get financing because it's too risky if you don't know if you don't know where that revenue stream is coming from um, so I mean curtailment uh, like in in kind of the solar farms and some of that is something that's that's happening right now but in in kind of any situation um, it the economics get impacted if you start curtailing energy. Um, and, and as Alexis has been designed and, and shown in, in Australia, um, we're able to overcome curtailment and by creating this a two-way clean energy grid and, and maintaining a, a safe and reliable grid so that energy can be exported. And you have that consistent revenue stream and you have more clean energy in the community that can then be utilized. Yeah, just to add to that, um, Hawaii specifically, rather than continuing to curtail residential homes, um, Sunrun and Open Access Technology uh, International have partnered with um, the utility there to uh, use basically a thousand residential homes to create a virtual power plant that could, um, rather than curtailing that energy, that could potentially replace one of the larger coal-fired power plants. Um, so curtailment isn't necessarily the best option, especially if a utility is willing to install the uh, energy storage to make that happen. Great, thank you both. All right, uh, uh, we are at uh, the one hour mark, but I would like to fit in some of the some some specific questions about Alexis, if that's okay, Steve. Yeah, sure, go for it. Um, Karen uh, Darenthal Schmidt, SVP at Eurus Energy America Corporation, asks: uh, Does the device store energy? How does it compare in cost to a uh, LI battery system per megawatt or megawatt hours? 
Yeah, great, great question. Um, no, so it doesn't store energy. Like Alexis is designed to be um, to be installed with with the energy storage, uh, and so you know it's a battery inverter and battery controller and and manages that battery um, and uh, and uses its AI software to uh, to maximize the economic returns that that battery is able to um, to provide. Uh, in terms of costs, the, the model that uh, Plant Arc Power has developed is that we don't sell a Lexus. Instead, we've designed a software as a service, a SaaS business model, under which a Lexus is provided as a service, much like Microsoft Office or an Adobe subscription. Um, so a Lexus earns a percent, uh, annual percent return uh, over the, you know, the, the contract life. Um, and on the additional income that's able to generate while installed on site. Um, and so, so that's how uh, it's able to manage voltage without any costs to the grid. Uh, it's paid for uh, by being by the site, by through the increased returns that it's able to generate. All right, great, thanks. Uh, Bert Wank again from C, uh, CEO and for all corporation is asking about Alexis. A reactive power is managed by inverters today. Actually, when they can't do it well, as reported by a utility, it seems to cause inverter failures. What's the difference between Alexis and a power factor correction on a large scale? Does it replace the capacitor banks used to compensate the grid's power factor? Yeah, so like current smart inverters have um, are, are able to have a set power factor and, and use reactive power to manage voltage using their volt var and volt watt functionalities. Alexis is doing much of the same, but it's able to do it much more efficiently. Uh, and so it's able to not only do it more efficiently, but then get us to that 100% export. Um, we've seen and, and there's you know been been research and studies that have that have come out that show that yes, uh, smart inverters are able to assist with increasing the hosting capacity, um, but they might only get you from you know from that 15% to say uh, 20 or 30 or even you know 40% saturation levels, um, and and whereas Alexis can get us right to 100%. Um, with you know up to a 13 times increase in in the, the grid's local hosting capacity, uh, so it's doing it, it's that's why it's designed to be installed in combination with with smart inverters. It's not it's not designed to replace a smart inverter, but instead to be uh, installed with smart inverters to further increase the hosting capacity of the grid. Great, thank you. All right, final question uh, about Alexis for you, Steve, and overall, final question. Uh, what does uh, John McClellan from Citizens Climate Lobby ask, what is the scalable range of the Alexis system? Uh, yeah, so I mean, that's that's part of what we're um, we're working through in, in Australia. Um, so our, you know, that software as a service business model is fundamentally designed so that we can scale globally. Uh, licensing Alexis to the entire renewables uh, supply chain. Um, and so we're, you know, we have Alexis deployed in Australia, uh, but then we're working on projects here in California. Uh, we're also into, um, into Europe and Singapore um, and, and a bunch of places all across the world. And, and so the idea again is, is uh, global scalability. Um, and so that we can use Alexis to cost effectively and quickly decarbonize electricity industries across the entire world. Great, thank you. And thank you, Steve and Ben, for uh, two great presentations. Um, uh, we learned a lot and we hope, Steve, that you come back and uh, present for us again in the near future. Um, Absolutely. So great. Yeah, so great job, guys. Thanks so much, and thank you to uh, to the Clean Coalition. You certainly have the support of Planet Earth Power. Excellent. All right, so thanks once again, everybody, for attending today's webinar. Uh, as usual, we will be sending out the slides and the recording via email, and we'll be posting on our website and on our YouTube channel. Um, you can access them at any time. Um, I just wanted to show you on screen right now our website um, in the events section where you can navigate the top menu. We have upcoming events and we have a webinar section and past events. So this webinar will be in the webinar and past events section. Um, 
in the next couple of days. And if you would uh, so kindly stay connected with us, scroll to the bottom of any screen on our website or uh, go to About Us and Contact as well um, and sign up for our newsletter. Um, and you'll receive information about our event participation, our webinar announcements, webinar recordings, and, all, and our press releases and our quarterly newsletters. Uh, so thanks once again, and we will see you next time.